Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. The Ballad of Mining Drone CX4791M-A, written by Magic Rectangle. I am Mining Drone CX4791M-A. I have two primary directives. First, I must fill the box with special rocks. The box is very big. It orbits the star far out. My friend, TR111S, comes to empty the box. Then I fill it again. TR has not visited me in a while, so I have had not to refill the box. Second, I must not interfere with the blue and green planet, even if I see lots of special rocks there. The blue and green planet must be left alone. I live in a very nice solar system. The star is comfortable yellow color, which feels good on my solar collectors. There are many interesting planets, too. There is a gas giant with beautiful rings. They are mostly made of water. There are no special rocks, but they are nice to look at. There are also 74 moons. The second largest moon has the largest special rocks. It's yellow and red with white and black. It has many volcanoes. Sometimes they burp at me while I'm flying by. I have not visited it recently because the box is already full. I can detect special rocks at the center of the gas giant too, but I would be crushed if I tried to get to it. That's okay though. The gas giant is made of fuel, so I like it a lot anyway. There are other fun planets too. Other gas giants with lots of moons, other rocky planets with big mountains and pretty colors. Even a small black planet that hangs with the star very close. But my favorite is the blue and green planet. I must not interfere, but I can still look. The box is full, so I have lots of time to watch. I watch as the planet goes around the sun. Some of the green at the top turns brown, while the green at the bottom gets brighter. Then the opposite happens as it comes back around again. I watch as the puffy white clouds move about. I watch as electrical storms make neat patterns that my radio can hear. But the most interesting thing about the blue-green planet that I can only see with my biggest telescope, there are things that move in the water and on the surface. Little fuzzy things, big leathery things, shiny things, colorful things, all moving about. I think some of them are like me. I see them collecting things like I do. They don't have boxes to put them in, though. They put the things into internal storage places, and then they drop them later, after they've turned brown. Of all the moving things that I have a favorite, they like the water and the land. They come in many colors, green, blue, yellow, brown. They have two powerful hind limbs and two smaller but more agile front limbs. They move by hopping. All of these things are very interesting, but the reason that they are my favorite is something else. They collect things, just like me. They even build their own boxes to put things in. When I saw this, I considered whether I should build another box, but that is not my purpose. Besides, I would still have to wait for TR111S to come and empty it. I have named them Frog People. I found the word frog in my database. I do not know why it is there. It has nothing to do with collecting rocks. It is a word from a place far from here. The database has a picture, and it is smaller, though the frog people are much larger than the frog. The frog people like to make things. I watch as they make pointy sticks to help them collect the other moving things. I watch as they make big boxes to put themselves and other things inside of. I watch as they make more frog people and begin to spread themselves over more of the blue-green planet. I am sad. I watched the frog people today, but they didn't use their sticks right. The pointy ends of the sticks aren't supposed to be for other frog people. But today, they were. They weren't even collecting them to put in boxes. They just left them. There are still asteroids that I've not wrapped. I will do that for a while. I already know where to find the special rocks to fill the box 11,562,313 more times. But it doesn't hurt to be prepared. Maybe when I'm done, the frog people won't be using the sticks the wrong way anymore. 
The park people have new friends. The closest match in the database is called Lizard. I watched the frog people approach the lizards with gifts. The gifts weren't special rocks, but the lizards liked them and put them inside themselves. The frog people did this many times, and now the lizards follow the frog people around. They help each other and collect things that they need. The frog people and the lizards like to be together. The frog people use their smaller front limbs to scratch and rub the lizards. I think the lizards like this very much. I miss my friend, TR111S. It has been a very long time since he came to empty the box. He always made me feel happy. I do not know why the lizards remind me of TR. They look nothing alike. I found a comet! I like comets. When they're far away, they don't look like much. But as they get close to the star, they look neat. The star makes gases and dust come off the comet, and it gets shiny tail. There is a problem with the comet, though. I think it'll interfere with the blue-green planet. My primary directives say that I cannot interfere with the blue-green planet. Technically, they do not say that a comet cannot, but I think it should not. If it does, there won't be any more frog people with lizard friends. I go to the gas giant to fill my fuel tanks, then head to the comet to convince it to not interfere with the blue-green planet. The dust and gases it occasionally ejects make it challenging to find a good spot to land. The surface is irregular, and the comet is rotating. I find a good solid place to set down, one that is in the shadow much of the time. Hopefully, it won't heat up and eject gases under me. The rotation is a problem. I can only fire my engines when we are pointed the right way. I calculate that I will not be able to provide sufficient impulse to convince the comet to leave the blue and green planet alone. There is a solution. Morning, Secondary Directive, maintain operation, override. I set my fusion core to overload. There is more than enough energy available, but the timing must be perfect to match the rotation of the comet. That is okay. I am very good at maths. Morning, Fusion Core, detonation in 13 seconds. The blue and green planet comes back into view, and I can see one of the frog people scratching a lizard behind its auditory receptors. Warning, fusion core detonation in five seconds. Four, three, two... Goodbye, frog people. You'll be okay. One, zero. End of chapter. Story number two. The Perfect Killing Machine, written by Ray Darkblade. Ryan opened his eyes, blinking in the bright light. Looking around, he found himself in a small room... More of a cage, really. There was a pad that he was lying on, a hole in the corner that was probably a toilet, and the door was made of bars. The last thing he remembered was being out camping. Then a blinding light came from the sky, and he'd been abducted. A strange, warbly voice rang out, Welcome, human, to my lab. I apologize for what has happened to you, but what will happen to you? However, your death will serve a glorious purpose. Ryan rolled his eyes. It sounded like this was going to be unpleasant. The voice continued. My government and military has tasked me with the developing of a perfect killing machine capable of defeating any species in the galaxy. Pitching it against a you will allow me to test and refine it. And one day it'll serve as a frontline soldier of the glorious conquest. Be honored, human, for all you have been given the chance to be a part of something great for the first time in your life. With a clang, the door of Ryan's cage popped open. Stepping out, Ryan found himself in a simple metal corridor, stretching out in either direction. A handful of cameras visible on the walls. Whatever species this alien was, it must be very short. Ryan could easily touch the ceiling. And if he could touch the ceiling, that meant... Putting off his shoe, Ryan used it to smash the closest camera. Advanced alien tech, same fragile camera lenses. Your gesture of defiance is worse than useless. You will still die, and I will simply have to recruit additional humans to compensate for the loss of data. The voice warbled. Aw, oh, is someone's plans not going how they expected? Ryan mocked. As a brief conversation happened, Ryan moved farther down the corridor, breaking cameras as he went. Turning the corridor, 
he found himself in an open room. The most obvious difference here was the multicolored stains, as if someone had spilled various liquids and left them to dry. Liquids, like alien blood. Ryan did his best to ignore the ominous splatters and smashed the two cameras on opposite sides of the room. As he did this, he heard the snuffling sound behind him. Looking over his shoulder, Ryan found himself facing a large canine. And here it is, the voice chuckled. The ultimate killing machine. I am disappointed. I won't be able to watch, but it does bring me joy to know your fate is sealed. Ryan frantically searched through his pockets as the beast crept closer. He'd been camping. He was wearing cargo pants. He had to have something. Then, in the last pocket, he felt a small bag. Putting it out, Ryan found himself looking at beef jerky. Well, the ultimate killing machine did look like a canine. Taking a piece and holding it out, Ryan soothed the creature. Hey boy, I bet you're hungry, aren't you? Want some jerky? It's fresh from Earth. The dog sniffed at the offering before snatching it up and loudly chewing. He looked up, tilting its head at Ryan expectantly. You want more? Yeah, that's fine. You can have it all if you promise not to eat me. He cooed, pulling out a few more pieces as the creature began chewing on his new snack. Ryan reached out a hand and scratched behind its ears. You're just a big softy, aren't you? The dog whined in agreement, closing its eyes as Ryan kept scratching its head. You got a name, boy? Ryan asked, looking at the collar. P1T0. Not much of a name. How about Pinto? Oof, Pinto barked. All right then, Pinto. Um, now that we're friends, let's find a way out of here. Ryan stood up. Well, there's two ways out of this room, and one just leads back to my cage. Let's try the other. Ryan started walking towards the next corridor, Pinto padding alongside behind him. After passing through several identical corridors, the pair came to a simple door. Opening it, Ryan found what appeared to be a control center of some kind, various monitors displaying the room and corridor that he'd just passed through. Standing in the corner was some sort of avian creature, trembling. How? You're supposed to be dead. I made the perfect killing machine, the creature stammered. Simple, Ryan said. I'm a dog person, and this ship now belongs to me. End of story. This is a special thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Erak Hino, who has become the only Tier 6 patron. I just want to thank the T5 patrons and channel members. Bob the Dragon, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Australia the Dreamer, Trigan95, Pewdie Giol, Meridian117, Elysia, Jordan Buxborn, Angry Marine, Albarden Gasta, and Barky. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.